right, and we're started. Hey everyone, welcome to a new video. Today is a little bit different. I have author EA Megs with me today. She is the author of the Ice Age uh, Dreamer series. Um, she has a new book coming out. So Meg, can you please introduce yourself to people that might not know you and just give a little backstory. Okay, um, I'm, I'm really bad at introducing myself because I never know what to say. Um, first of all, thanks so much, Joe, for having me on. Um, I've, uh, I'm a lifelong compulsive writer who also has a background in um, natural history. Um, well, I have a background in a lot of different things, but uh, my passions are natural history and paleoanthropology and science in general. So um, this book series has just kind of been a marriage of my interests. Yeah, uh, I'm sure a lot of people that watch my videos and our, our communities are very intertwined, I would say, is, is something that's fair to say. Um, I agree, yes. So I feel like a lot of people know who you are, who who are in my community and obviously in your community, I hope. Um, I so too. <laughs> <laughs> but for everyone who doesn't know, uh, Meg's uh, books are my favorite series so far that I've gotten into. It's one of the only series that I can actually sit down and read. Um, not to cast shadows on other series but some of the other series get a little too over dramatic for my taste and all that uh meg series is just straight to the point uh there's some jokes some humor it's, it's very good very uh informational and the stories are always catching um do you want to explain some of your characters before we jump into some of the questions or um well i try not to give too much away so i don't yeah. accidentally uh, <laughs> put out any spoilers but the main character is a young neanderthal man named tris um the, the series is a narrative um i purposely uh, set up the books that way so that i and hopefully readers would be more in, engaged with him as a character um you know you have to expect that anyone who who lives that far back in history would probably have a, at least a slightly different point of view um, than most modern people. So I, my hope was that by um, presenting the books as a narrative that they're getting more into his mind and his thought process and how he's experiencing the world. Yeah, and in your books, certainly, uh, they certainly show that in your writing and all that. Um, the first question I wanted to ask you uh, was, why did you choose a male main character when so many other series in, I guess, the same genre choose a female char main character? I, I didn't choose a male character. Um, when I write, I have no idea where the plot comes from. I have never sat down and written a book you know, by devising a, you know, a storyline and creating characters. Um, for me, um, the whole plot just suddenly appears in my brain out of nowhere. I have no idea whatsoever where these stories came from. Um, you know, it's, it, it almost feels as though all I'm doing is just typing up something that actually happened you know it's not my story i'm just telling i'm telling his story you know it's 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 hard to explain um but all the novels that i've written over the years i have never um had to devise a plot they they come to me ready made i guess i'm lucky in that sense yeah and i, I can imagine that helps a lot not having to sit down and just say well this character is this and this is his story and all that and you you, you kind of go in a more um i guess you'd say natural approach to it where you sort of just let your mind make up the story rather than forcing yourself to make a story if that makes any sense um yeah, it would be something like that. Like I say, um, the the whole storyline just appears overnight, complete. 
And, you know, it's just my job to take it out of my brain and put it in book form. Yeah. So right now there's five books in the series that are complete. Six. Six. And I'm working on number seven. Yes. Yes. Uh, So the next question I'm going to ask is how many books or series do you plan in the future? I know that you just, you have physical copies right now of your upcoming children's series and you're still yes, working I just on the received them series. today. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I guess, do you kind of yeah. want to explain the children's series or do you want to talk about the new upcoming book? Uh, you got so much stuff going on right now. <laughs> right. Right. Um, well, the, the children's series is something I've had on a back burner since the inception of the adult series. Um, the main character in the adult series, Tris, has uh, a son named Fox, and the children's series features Fox and his adventures. So, um, you know, it's uh, a companion series to the adult series, and I'm guessing that the adult series will probably have maybe nine or ten books in total before um, the whole tale is told. And the children's series will probably have three or four books, but that's just my best guess at this point. You just, uh, you can't see that far into the future. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess I'll ask, uh, is there anything in, in your books when I'm reading it, you talk a lot about um, tools and equipment that the Neanderthals and early people who migrated to Europe would use. Is there something in the series that you would like to see recreated by experimental archaeologies or so on? You mean as far as their tools and their yeah, kits? Like their tools, general like kits and all that. Well, you know, there's been quite a few reproductions and, you know, I think all their tools are just fascinating. Um, it might be interesting to see, you know, an entire kit that the average Neanderthal man might carry um, assembled, but um, but nothing nothing in particular. Um, say, I I just admire uh, primitive technology tremendously. Uh, I I think that primitive humans um, don't get their due recognition because, you know, so much of uh, what they used and did in their day-to-day lives, you know, by today's standards is just um, just amazing. I can only imagine that they must have been uh, master outdoorsmen in a way that modern people can scarcely uh, imagine. Yeah. It, it would be incredible to, to spend a day, you know, with a, a primitive person and not even necessarily a Neanderthal, but just any person from 40,000 years ago. And, you know, just see what they did and just as part of the routine. <laughs> I agree. I, as someone who uh, practices all the primitive, well, not all of them, but a lot of the primitive skills that are in your book, it, it would certainly be cool just to spend a day or even an hour with one of them. Not like you said, not necessarily a Neanderthal, but even an early human, just an hour, just to learn how they are, learn what they do. And that would like we've only known about neanderthals maybe 150 years um i think that's right but uh just in that hour alone you could rewrite almost a century worth of uh history oh absolutely right i mentioned um going off topic of whatever Uh, i imagine if we did go back in time some magical or scientific way uh, we would find out that they used a lot of wood and a lot more bone than we like tend to give them uh, recognition for. Right, I agree. I I I think that a lot of the things that uh, um, you know just didn't withstand the tests of time. Uh, you know, their fiber technologies, um, basketry. Um, you know, there's natural sources of, of clay. I'm, I'm sure that, uh, you know, that when they were making their uh, open air uh, structures that, that they were probably mudded to help keep the weather out. And, um, 
you know, I, I don't see them necessarily having potter's wheel, but I wheels, but I think that they would have had, you know, like um, pinch pottery just yeah. to make basic uh, vessels to to keep things in. Yeah. Um, yeah and, and, uh, and then like uh, uh, Dr. Rebecca Rake Sykes, I think is how you say her name. Um, in another podcast, um, she mentioned the fact that if they did find pottery or pottery shards and mysterian levels, she would not be surprised at all. And I think one day we'll find we'll find some form of pottery in a Neanderthal site for sure. It um, wouldn't wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, I do know that our local sources of natural clay. Um, are pretty fragile. You can make things out of them, but our um, local clay is kind of sandy. Some uh, some clay is better quality than others, but I could see that um, a lot of clay items maybe wouldn't hold up all that well just because of the, you know, sand and other impurities in the clay that would make it fall apart. And I um, also think that we would be surprised to know um, how well their clothing was made. Um, yes. One of my pet peeves is seeing the Neanderthal portrayed, you know, with a, a pelt or two haphazardly thrown across his shoulder yes. and standing yes. in snow. And um, I, I just don't think that that's realistic to expect that these people no. would have survived <laughs> um, even an average winter, never mind an ice age winter, <laughs> with, no, you know, not, dressed not that way. And I think that they would have had um, very well-made clothing um, to keep out, uh, you know, not just to um, cover them, but to keep out cold drafts. You know, they would have had to been uh, fitted clothing. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I am, I don't want to give away your location, but I am, I'm in Canada and you're in the States and right. I'm, I'm only five or six something hours north of you and it gets freezing here during the winter like minus 20 ish um so and that's probably not even compared to ice age periods interglacial periods so right. i don't and even with modern clothes that's still pretty rough to deal with i don't yes, like you said exactly. I, I do not think that they were just draping some half tanned hides over them and uh walking barefoot in the snow is I've done both and it's not fun. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I also am pretty sure that they would have had methods for making um, footwear and at least some of their clothing um, waterproofed or water resistant. Yes, I, I agree. They, they must have had some sewing technique like the Inuit use to waterproof their hides. Um, I just don't. I just don't see them sewing the way most uh, Southern, I would say Southern Native American tribes did. And that's really like, uh, I know it's, there's a whole ocean dividing Europe, the Eurasian, Eurasian uh, continent and all that with the North American continent. But really that's the, the best examples we have because if you look at it, uh, a lot of the hunter-gatherer tribes in Africa do not make their own clothing um, anymore. Uh, in Australia, they don't. The only people we can really compare that to is the Inuit, the Sami, and some other Native American tribes because that's the most recent. Uh, and that, and it's unfortunate that so much has been lost to history. But I guess it's fun to kind of guess. But if you're gonna guess, at least make it realistic. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, so a follow-up question to that is, do you have a favorite tool from prehistory or a favorite like hand axe or arrowhead style or something like that? I do admire the hand axes in general. I don't know if I'd necessarily say that they're a favorite, but I've always had a soft spot for the hand axes. You know, they're just so beautifully made. I love the symmetry. I love the utility because you know, what can't you do with them? You can do almost anything with them. Um, so yeah, I would have to say it would be hand axes. Yeah, I agree with that. Hand axes are definitely my favorite thing. 
not only to recreate but to um uh admire I, I should say i own a few thankfully people in the communities have sent me some over the years but yeah they're still fun to admire <laughs> um so this question sort of relates to your books but it doesn't give anything away uh do you believe the theory that neanderthals appeared to have large gatherings every few years and if so what do you think they were doing at these gatherings i've only heard about that in passing reference and i'm not quite sure where that theory uh is derived from um you know if there's some sort of archaeological evidence that there were occasional gatherings i mean we have to assume that occasionally groups of neanderthals and you know and possibly uh other humans who were around at that time would have at least wandered into each other and met each other uh, yeah. whether or not they were organized um you know who can say maybe i i don't know it's a hard i don't know too much about it either but uh i think it's that one site in jersey and another one in france there they have some evidence of uh it will be like five years there's no activity and then all of a sudden in this place there's mountains and mountains of activity just within the layers and uh sometimes it appears that homo sapiens were using the layers for a couple months at a time and then the most or the neanderthals were using the layers at a time it's all confusing um I haven't looked too far into it because that's not really an interest of mine. I'm more, I'm more in the interests of the lithics, the lithic industries of the Neanderthals and early Europeans and all that. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd say it would not surprise me if um, you know that there were occasional gatherings. You know, I, I think it's inevitable that they would have run into each other. Yeah. At least then, on occasion, whether <laughs> intentionally or not. Yeah, and eventually they'd have to, I wouldn't say trade women, but they'd have to trade like younger people just to keep their clients healthy. I don't, I don't think they were interbreeding that much with each other. Um, but I think that there's some evidence from the El Cedron site where they were trading females and I think younger men, but I could be wrong at of that uh i have um, read something about um that uh i i think it was i can't swear to this but i think it was looking at genetics that um in at least certain areas the um somehow they've been able to tell that uh the neanderthal mothers were older and the fathers were younger. <laughs> and again, I, I'm guessing that this was. Uh, I, I think that but, you know, genetically, I, it was an article <laughs> that. I, yeah, it was. I read this article a, a while ago and I read so many articles every day, sometimes unless it's something that I really want to take note of. Um, it just sort of gets lost in the shuffle. But I did read about that. And I'm sure that, you know, when groups did meet each other that uh, you know that there would have been some let's let's call it co-mangling going on <laughs> and uh um and i think that that's just natural not only in humans but in any species because that you know bringing in those new genes um helps strengthen the groups overall so you know whether we're we're talking about bears or, or people or deer or whatever, you know, give, bringing in those new genes. Yeah. It just helps everybody. It's, uh, I guess genetics is still something very young, especially paleogenetics. It's just, it's so hard to understand that you pretty much have to have a degree in it to fully comprehend everything that they're trying to tell you. Cause you're not, I don't think you're going to get that. Every, all the information out of uh, a couple tabloid articles um, no no yeah. and not even out of scientific papers necessarily um so yeah i i agree and um from what i've heard in uh 
genetic presentations, they're admitting even amongst themselves that the field is still so new, that there's so much that they're still learning. Um, but sometimes, you know, there just aren't any real answers yet. They can throw out theories, but, um, you know, they're still looking for answers. Yeah. And, and sometimes it, the answers change, <laughs> you yeah, know, as they get more that. information. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes uh, you find the answer and it throws you back a couple steps or it throws you forward a couple hundred steps. It's, right. it's, it's crazy field. <laughs> Um, sort of a lead up to both of those questions. Uh, do you think Neanderthals that were already established in Eurasia slowed the expansion of modern humans who were trying to, I guess, migrate into the area as Clive Finlinson claims? I'm not sure if they slowed the migration into the area. Um, you know, we're take, talking about such a, a a long journey that the uh, you know the Homo sapiens were taking from from Africa um, into Eurasia. That you know, I'm probably would have taken hundreds, thousands of years for them to gradually work their way into Eurasia. Um, you know, my personal thought is is that as they started trickling in and just kept coming in you know wave after wave of people that um the neanderthal were just and the probably the denisovan too were just probably um absorbed by these um tribes of incoming people yeah it, i guess overcome does not really the word to say it i i definitely uh how do i explain this <laughs> trying to think before i speak um i don't see it really as neanderthals disappearing i see it more like you said being assimilated um because obviously if they just fully disappeared they right. we wouldn't have any of their dna in us but because they're right. They're still like myself. I have nearly five percent of my DNA is purely or uniquely Neanderthal, um, and that's a big number considering that was almost forty-five, fifty thousand years ago, um, when or around that, give or take, however many years. And so, I don't really like the when tabloid articles or people that are just getting into this say they disappeared. I I see it more as they became us like hybridization and all that and they more like their traits disappeared but their genetic le uh, legacy lives on is pretty much how i would put it right right i almost see it as um that uh purebred homo sapiens have almost disappeared because um, probably the percentage of human beings on the planet who are purebred homo sapiens are probably pretty small percentage. Um, yeah, we're almost all hybrids. Um, uh, so I don't interrupt think, you. yeah. Um, I think, yeah, sorry. Uh, I think the, uh, the only place right now where there's a hundred percent pure homo sapiens is in Africa right now in central Africa. Parts of Africa, right, and because of um, uh, genetic flow back into Africa, even the number of people in Africa, you know, who haven't been affected by um, backflow, as they're diplomatically calling it, <laughs> um, um, you know, ha have brought uh, more Neanderthal and I would assume Denisovan genes um, into, back into Africa. Yeah, it's, that's definitely the way you put it is a way better way to put it. Um, I guess we wouldn't be the pure Homo sapiens. <laughs> we would no. sort of be, we would sort of be like a hundredth generation hybrids or whatever. <laughs> I guess I don't know how you would put that, uh, but yeah, the, I agree with you on that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> 
I kind of blew my brain there, blew my mind there. Um, sort of leading up to the whole intermingling hybridization thing. Do you think the Denisovans and Neanderthals and whatever unidentified, not yet known hominin species passed on local knowledge to the newcomers? Or do you think the Homo sapiens migrating into the area slowly learned these skills? I guess it would depend on how much interaction they had with the, the Neanderthal, the Denisovans. Um, you know, if they were in an area that wasn't already populated, they would have had to fly by the seat of their pants and figure it out on their own. But um, I'm sure if groups of people were meeting that there was um, knowledge exchanged back and forth between the groups. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I'm just trying to go over my bullet points right now. Uh, do you think, uh, maybe not that one. Yeah. Do you think hybridization with Neanderthals and Denisovans and again, any unidentified hominins helped modern humans evolve at a faster rate? Um, I think they call it some, I think it's a theory or a hypothesis. I don't know. Do not remember the difference right now, but some are starting to say now that there was a paleolithic revolution where all the interbreeding helped unlock something in the homo sapien brain after hybridization that allowed us to start becoming more um civilized i guess as a way like start becoming who we are now i read something about this a few years ago and I, i'd have to dig into the dusty files in my brain and try to retrieve that information um I, I, I think it's really hard to say. I, I think that that intermingling definitely helped make us who we are today. Um, the, if I remember correctly, the articles that I read as I understood them, and I have to um, approach this as I understood it, because sometimes I read something and someone else will read it and come at it from a completely different angle. But as I understood it, um, they were saying that, um, you know, there were certain, um, if not cultural, but just innate um, attributes that the Neanderthal had um, that uh, courtesy of the intermingling uh, may have been passed on to the uh, Homo sapiens that changed um, Homo sapiens in a way that um, made them slightly different people. Are, now, are we talking about the same theory or am I um, completely off base here? It, it sounds the same. I don't really know much about it I, because I get into all these things and then I don't follow up with them. Uh, <laughs> but it sounds, it sounds about right. Uh, it sounds... Yeah. yeah, that's completely speculative. I mean, who can, who yeah. can say it's an interesting theory? It you know, is, yes. I suppose it could be, you know, it could be legitimate, but, you know, so much of what we think we know about early peoples is complete conjecture. And, yeah, um, you know, we can follow the clues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty it's much. It's kind of fun, but, uh, you know, it's, we're just speculating. <laughs> yeah, I guess a lot of it really comes down to guessing. <laughs> yeah but that's fun i mean i i love it i i love talking about it as you as you know <laughs> yes um <laughs> uh, i i just had to pause the video to ask meg a question i didn't want to uh spoil anything in her books so i'm going to ask the question again what um oh no i can't remember it <laughs> What are some of the ways you think Neanderthals preserve food? Uh, do you think they had access to salt or what are your thoughts on that? I think access to salt probably would have been fairly rare. 
Um, you know, unless they came upon some natural salt deposit, uh, my best guess is that they were probably uh, drying and smoking meat as far as long-term preservation goes. Um, I'm also guessing that uh, in areas that had year-round permafrost that they may have dug into the soil and um, made a cold storage cache to, yes. to keep foods preserved that of course would be subject to raids by animals and possible spoilage by you know rainwater seeping in or different things uh, but uh, it, it would have been something that they could have easily accessed yeah going going to the uh, permafrost burial thing um, that's not a very scientific term <laughs> um, uh, on some of the shows that are centered in Alaska and on you know, the Inuit up there, and even in some of the Facebook groups I'm in, the Inuit, they still do that today. I think they call them suit houses, and uh, they dig down into the permafrost, and then they have a big um, structure that it's made out of logs and uh, what is it called? Moss. And then they try to keep animals out, but like you said, they're going to get raided no matter what. It's pretty hard to stop a grizzly bear. I imagine it would be pretty hard to stop a cave bear. Um, right, right. But it, I don't see it as impossible for Neanderthals to use the permafrost. Um, but smoking meat, I definitely agree with that. Uh, that's something that I do. I, in my room that I'm in right now for recording, I actually have a bunch of meat that is stored that was smoked not too long ago. An experiment with salt, uh, you have to have a lot of salt to cure meat. Um, and obviously, if they didn't have access to a lot of salt, I don't think that they would waste it on curing. They would probably use it as a seasoning, would be my guess, or something like that. Right, right, right. Yes. And, you know, there are other preservation method, uh, methods that use um, fats and even honey, but having enough fat and honey to use for preservation purposes is probably not real likely. <laughs> yeah. I and mean, I imagine that they would want to just eat the fat or cook with it or something. Cause they need the honey, right? <laughs> yeah. It, you can't, it, it's kind of hard to keep yourself warm on just pure protein. You got to have fat or carbohydrates in there. Right. Um, yes. Fat was very important back then and carbs. So leading up to that, uh, I'm out of bullet points now because uh, we pretty much just talked about all of them. Leading to the fat question, do you think Neanderthals tended to target larger to medium-sized animals because of their fat? Or do you think that they targeted them just out of convenience? I'm guessing that it was for um, all the resources uh, collectively you know, not only the fat and the meat and the hides, but, you know, the, the bones and the sinews, the, you know, the whole deal, the intestines, uh, you know, the stomachs, the bladder, you know, yeah. I would have been using a lot of those things. Um, in my books, I often leave out a lot of details because when I wrote the first book, um, after I wrote the first draft, I reread it and I realized that it sounded like an Ice Age survival manual. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it was sort of was overwhelming the story. So I decided, well, you know, this really isn't going to interest very many people, you know, have that much detail about survival. So yeah. I leave a lot out, but, um, but I definitely think that back then they just would have you know, targeted the animals that, um, well, first of all, that were in the area were accessible or, you know, or easy enough to, to get to by following, uh, you know, seasonally migrating herds and everything, but the ones that offered the, the most and the best resources and, um, you know, and that's definitely the bigger predators. I mean, you can survive for a little while on rabbits, but there's actually something called rabbit sickness, where if you try to live yeah. on them for too long, you're just not getting enough fat. And, um, you know, it causes severe health problems and even death. And um, from what I've read, even about, um, you know, because they talk about Neanderthal uh, cannibalism, that humans aren't actually a real good source of <laughs> nutrition 
um, especially humans back then who probably didn't have a whole lot of fat on them because they're not, if you're cannibalizing your, your neighbors or whomever, <laughs> that, uh, you know, you're, you're not getting enough nutrients on them to survive long term. Unless you have fat neighbors, I guess, but you know, yeah. back then there probably <laughs> probably weren't a whole lot of people, you know, who had enough fat on them to be nutritionally, yeah, uh, sustainable diets. And um, and the the evidence shows that Neanderthals would have been extremely muscular, lean people. So I don't I don't really think that they unless they were eating just the brain, because the brain's pretty much all fat and organs, but. That's kind of a waste. I don't think you're going to kill your neighbor just for their brain. You're going to get uh, right, right. No, I disease. think it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that it would have been um, either absolute desperation or that these um, people were um, um, violent invaders or something that you yeah. had to get rid of somehow. So, um, you know, so if they were cannibalizing people, it would have been absolute necessity or they were undesirables or miscreants or something that uh you know yeah. we're not someone they wanted to keep around but i don't think that it would have been done on a routine team sorry to spit this out a routine basis for nutrition because i've i've read in any number of sources that people just aren't all that nutritious to eat uh, you know as far <laughs> as a sustained diet um, yeah um it to me it I hate to say it because I make fun of it all the time, but to me, it seems like it, it even could have been a ritual practice. Uh, I believe it's called excarnation, where instead of burying the body, you you strip the flesh off of it and then you bury the bones. Um, you don't necessarily right. have to eat the flesh. Uh, you could just strip the bones off of it. But unfortunately, with that also, there is, again, I... It, I think it's called Goyette Cave. They have found evidence of uh, tooth marks on Neanderthal bones. Yes, I was going to say gnawing. Yeah. Yes, right. And my fourth book, The Cave of Bones, is actually uh, centered around the Goyette Caves. And um, it's a good name for it's, a book. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's it's fiction, <laughs> you know. So it's my. It's my take, and I think people might be a little. So I've had a, any number of people tell me that the the fourth book, The Cave of Bones, was their favorite, and um, it's it's one of my favorites, even though uh, you know there is cannibalism as part yeah. of the the storyline. But I I think I take it in a little different direction than most people expect. Um, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna leave it at that. But um, I, yeah. I did do a lot of research about um, the Neanderthal and cannibalisms in the Goya Caves and everything, yeah. and um, and also about um, as you say that sometimes it was um, you know just a ritual because you know back then um, it's hard to dig a hole in dirt that hasn't been previously yep. dug up, you <laughs> yeah. know. There's a, there's a lot have, of roots and you don't have a metal shovel. So you've got whatever you're using to dig the hole and to try to bury a person. And if it's winter and the ground yep. is frozen and even in the summer, you know, in areas where there's permafrost, that's some tough going there. Yeah. So, you know, did they just clean off all the flesh and, you know, just not to have a, a body rotting there in the corner of the, you know, in the corner of the room, you've got to do something with it. Um, yeah. If you don't want to just leave it out, you know, for the animals to eat, what do you do? You strip off the flesh. And um, in some cultures, uh, I read that they stripped off the flesh and they, um, in some cases, and I'm not talking about Neanderthal, I'm just talking about some of the yeah. primitive cultures, and they ate the flesh because that was a way of keeping their loved ones alive by incorporating them in your body. I was just about to mention that, yeah. That, yeah, uh, yeah. And when they heard about other people just burying their loved ones in the ground, they were totally appalled because why would you do that? <laughs> then they're then they're really dead. But if you eat them, you're keeping them alive and you're keeping them with you. So, you know, who knows what cultural practices they may have had and and even between, I mean, when you think of the the vast areas of Eurasia that the Neanderthals uh inhabited, you know, there were 
hundreds, thousands of different cultural practices, you know, amongst those people. Yes. And just the time frame too. Uh, they were yes, 400,000 exactly. years. That's a, that's longer than Homo sapiens have been around. <laughs> Right, right. And you think of even modern people, you know, how much our cultural practices change even over a hundred years. Yeah. I mean, well, just a hundred years I look years at my ago. high school pictures yeah. and I go, oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Know? Just how much has changed since then. A <laughs> hundred years ago, it was still common to see a horse in the city. No, you don't see right. that at all. Yes. Um, I guess... Sort of the move. I don't want to end on cannibalism. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess, do you have a favorite ice age animal that anytime something pops up of them, it just fascinates you? Because for me, it's, uh, it's, it's always been the aurochs. Um, the aurochs to me just seems like this magical being, even though it was basically just a giant cow. <laughs> and uh but they're just it's just something so fascinating about them the like we eat them now but a hundred thousand fifty thousand even up to i think the ninth no not in the 1900s the 1600s the that's when the last one died and uh they're just such a fascinating creature so do you have something similar to that where anything about them fascinates you to a weird point i guess <laughs> well i would say my favorite has to be the the woolly mammoth and that's because i have a soft spot for elephants period yeah that's way reasonable. back when um i went to a zoo where there were elephants actually walking around and you could pet them and feed them and so i had my handful of elephant kibble whatever it was and I held my hand out and I kind of expected that the elephant would use its trunk you know and take it and put take it out of my hand and put it in its mouth but no it opened its mouth it took my whole arm up to the elbow and just kind of sucked <laughs> the food off my hand and I'm like oh well that is weird yeah that was that's unexpected <laughs> It wasn't alarming because the elephant was so gentle, but my arm was in its mouth up to the elbow and it just, <laughs> then it just sucked the food off. But it was just such a gentle, lumbering animal, you know. I just, uh, ever since then, I've really felt an affinity for them. And um, I do a lot of research on elephants as part of writing about woolly mammoths because it's really, that's what we have to go on in modern yeah. times. Um we just have to assume that, uh, or at least I, I assume that the woolly, woolly mammoths would have at least shared um, some things in common with modern elephants. So uh, they are very closely related, I think. So they couldn't have been that far off. I think that the woolly mammoths genetically are uh, closely related to the um, Asian elephants, even though Asian elephants, um, my understanding is that Asian elephants are a bit smaller. Yeah. And of course, they're, you know, built entirely differently. Yeah. Uh, you know, the woolly mammoths are very distinctive from other pachyderms. That's true. Yeah. The, so lead, going off of woolly mammoths, do you think that we'll ever see, for example, Pleistocene Park, they want to bring back the woolly mammoth to help preserve the permafrost or the Siberian tundra? Do you think right. that... Pardon? I just said right. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. Um, my headphones cut out when you said that. Uh, so do you think in your or my lifetime that we'll see maybe elephant mammoth hybrids, especially with all the new um, permafrost elephants that are not elephants, uh, mammoths that they're finding nowadays? It wouldn't surprise me. I don't know if I'll see it in my lifetime, but you're a lot younger than I am, so possibly within your lifetime. But, um, you know, because it takes, you know, so many generations, at least as my understanding goes, you know, they um, they get, a, you know, enough DNA to do a Jurassic Park type thing, and it would take a, a number of generations to get an uh, animal that was a certain percentage of um for lack of a better term purebred woolly mammoth yeah. so uh, and elephants are a fairly long-lived animal 
Um, so, you know, each generation is going to take a significant amount of time. Yeah, that would it's pretty weird. <laughs> That's a really <laughs> weird. I know there's a lot of uh, ethical and uh, some people don't like that, but I'm open. <laughs> I'm open to see a woolly mammoth in my lifetime. <laughs> uh which would be pretty cool but uh, i don't know i think that's far future maybe my kids will hopefully see it i i'm not too sure i don't really follow that too much but the place to scene park uh that's just some very interesting stuff i'd like to go see that one day they got the like the heck cattle and the bison and horses right. and all that it just yeah. it it's not it's obviously not going to be the ice age experience but it's something that I guess would be nice to see just to kind of get a little bit of a glimpse into that distant past. Right. No, I, I agree. I think it would be uh, incredible to see. It's something that I would like to place. I would like to visit someday as well. Yeah. I might have to, uh, if I ever do end up going there, I'll have to bring my primitive clothing and chase some animals around. <laughs> <laughs> um so they might not be too thrilled I'll, if you bring your spear i will i'll, I'll just jump on them be a rodeo <laughs> rider for the day <laughs> <laughs> uh so i guess the final question here is uh why do you think uh there's such a strong bias towards neanderthals in an age where information is uh so free-flowing um, do you mean in general amongst the general population or do you mean amongst uh, scientists? Or uh, both? both. We'll say both. Yeah. Okay. Um, amongst the general population, my guess is that, you know, most people are, are probably too busy. It's just not on their radar, you know, to be following paleoanthropology and they just, you know, have, uh, repeatedly heard you know that neanderthals are stupid and hulking brutes and it's an insult to call someone a neanderthal um i welcome it <laughs> so uh so you know it's it's just not part of their life to be thinking about neanderthals in depth uh, but as far as scientists goes um i can't say i've um, heard some very well-respected scientists um, talk pretty negatively about the Neanderthal, even in the face of, you know, um, recent I, developments. I like, oh, sorry about that. I thought you cut out again. Um, sorry, keep going. Um, you know, um, they're putting on these presentations so showing pictures of uh, Homo sapien uh, works of art that were done 20, 30,000 years ago. And uh, 20, 30,000 years ago, these Homo sapiens very well could have been hybrids of Neanderthals. But not only that, you know, they're showing pictures of what is potentially Neanderthal art against um, Homo sapien art that is 20, 30, 40, 50, 60,000 years younger <laughs> than, yeah. the, than the Neanderthal art. And, yeah. um, you know, more recent studies that, that I've seen have shown uh, Neanderthal, um, what is proposed Neanderthal art um, presented in a different way where they've seen um, what they think might be outlines of animals you know they're they're looking at the um drawings on on caves that are at this point are are pretty faded yeah. you know and have been um exposed to to air and whatever mineral ac accumulation has grown over the the drawings and you know they're they're starting to figure out well gee that looks like it might have been a woolly mammoth originally this looks kind of like a a person sitting cross-legged and you know i i couldn't say if they're right or wrong in in these speculations but you know it's a possibility and um i have a harder time taking these scientists seriously when they're 
taking art that's so old and comparing it to art that is tens of thousands of years younger and yeah. saying, well, you know, the Neanderthal were uh, a limited people because, and that's putting it politely, <laughs> limited people yeah. because, you know, they, you know, why aren't they drawing pictures like this? And I'm looking at the, you know, the illustrations from the Chauvet caves and like, I can't draw a picture like that. Never mind, yeah. the, you know, uh, not even every Homo sapien can draw pictures like that. Um, I, so I just, yeah. I, I, I don't know why they have that prejudice, <laughs> but it's definitely out there in, in some people. And, you know, we're all I, different. I feel <laughs> like, what can uh, you say? I feel like a lot of it comes down to ego. Um, I don't, it probably sounds rude, but I feel like a lot of older scientists grew up with the idea that Neanderthals are inferior beings, dumb brutes and all that. And now they have to sort of, and, and, and a lot of them have been teaching in academia for years now, probably longer than I've been. So it, it probably is a real kick to the ego to basically be told everything you've been teaching up until this point has been wrong. Um, that's probably not too fun on your ego. And I don't think there should be a lot of egos in science, but unfortunately we're all human and you can't really control how your emotions feel, I guess. Right. Yeah. That's probably true. in in some people, I mean, you can, you can only guess, um, yeah. you know, it is, a, it is I'm one of those generalization. Yeah. I'm one of those older people too, and I had never given the Neanderthal a lot of thought um, up until, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 years ago. And, you know, I had misconceptions about them as well. Yeah. Um, I don't mind being proven wrong by science. I love learning new things. And yeah. even though occasionally something will come up that sort of contradicts what's in my books, you know, some new discovery, you know, but oh boy, now I have to work that in. But that's fine. <laughs> you know, yeah. I just hope the readers will bear with me and realize that, you know, as the uh, the field grows, that, um, you know, even though I try to do the best I can to, you know, research, to try to make things as uh, accurate and as plausible as I can in my books, um, you know, once in a while something comes along. It's like, oh, OK, I'm going to have to figure out how to write that in <laughs> yeah. to, uh, you know, to make it to make it right and, and you well as you're writing these books uh, like you say um things are changing so fast especially when it comes to neanderthals it seems uh it seems that there's been a resurgence of interest um with them especially with all the new uh genetic um or uh, yeah genetic evidence and all these new sites being found and more and more people are becoming interested it seems like um, like things are going back to the time when Ralph Selecki was digging up Shanidar Cave and even all that. Like it, 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 it seems like uh, there's a resurgence in Neanderthal popularity. I don't know if you feel the same way. Yeah, I have noticed it, but I think that's because there's been so many um, discoveries in the last um, couple of years or even five, ten years. You know, the field has just grown by leaps and bounds. Yeah. And like people that, well, nobody's like me. They just pop out of nowhere and I can help teach it. Well, not really teach it, but show this stuff to other people, much like yourself. Um, you can, you can sort of use social media to kind of show the average person. Um, this is how they actually were. This is what we currently know. Things are always moving. So yeah, I don't know if you feel that way, but I feel like a lot of a lot of it has to do with the new discoveries and social media. Like there's been compared to I'll say like 2015, there there wasn't very many uh, anthropology and paleoanthropology groups on Facebook. Probably not any, if I'm being honest. And now it seems that there's a bunch popping up um, all over the place now. With, oh. Uh, huh. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's 
kind of funny because 2015 is when I started writing my series. And um, <laughs> yeah, I guess I would say that there are probably more groups on social media now than there was back then. And there's certainly an awful lot more information out there now than um, there was back then. Yeah. Um, I guess that's uh, it. Uh, is there anything else you want to talk about? I can't think of anything off the top of my head except for to say thank you so much, Joe. I, uh, it's always fun talking with you. And thank yeah. you so much for inviting me to meet with you. On no problem. Um, so just uh, how do I close this? <laughs> Where's Anthony when we need him? Um, <laughs> uh, I guess uh, steal his phrase. So cave dweller friends. Uh. <laughs> I guess uh, I'll have links down in the description where you can find uh, Meg's websites and her medias. And um, you, do you want to let people know your website name and where to find books so they can purchase a copy of their own? Yeah, my uh, website is dreamerliteraryproductions.com. Um, that's the storefront page. So you can navigate from there to pretty much find anything you want, whether it's buying the books and hardcover, paperback, or ebook format, or um, check out the tabs and read about the different books and read the blog or, or whatever. Um, Oh, oh, and the reader reviews. <laughs> yes. See what other people think about the books. <laughs> well, I, all I can say from my perspective is the books are the favorite, my favorite thing in the library right now, our library. Um, I'm, Thanks I'm so much. I, I'm rereading chapter three because I, or book three, because I took, I took a break and then I sort of forgot. So I'm rereading it, but I hope to finish the series, hopefully by the end of the summer. I need to stop letting my ADHD get the best of me and just sit down and read. But once I start reading, it's pretty hard to stop because the stories are so very uh, enthralling, I think is the correct word to use. Um, but I thank, thank you for coming on. Uh, like you said, it's always a pleasure to have you on here. And the conversations are always fun. And Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'll be interested to hear what you think of the rest of them. I hope you enjoy all of them. It really does mean a lot to me when people give me feedback and, and tell me what they take away from the books. And, um, you know, some of the readers write to me and they get into detail about the parts that they really like in different stuff and how they're going to get a dog and name their dog after a character or something. <laughs> and, and I absolutely love it. I, you know, when I right that it's a pretty solitary occupation so i'm just here tapping away and um you know you don't know you know is your work uh, resonating with anybody you know does it mean anything to anybody and to have people tell me that they um enjoy the books or that they really relate to tris the main character i've had a um a lot of guys in particular tell me that they really relate to him I am the um, same way. I definitely relate to Trace. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and it, I'm, I'm just so glad. Really so glad. So thank you again for the opportunity to come on and talk with you and talk about my books and talk about ancient humans. <laughs> no problem. Um, so thank you for watching, everybody. Uh, again, this is E.A. Meggs, um, writer of the Dreamer series. Uh, you can find her in the description down below. Uh, again, thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you guys in the next one.